folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're still dealing with Matthew chapter 24 after all that we covered during the homecoming. And um, I'm pretty sure that when I'm done with Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to start a series. I'm still thinking about writing a book called The Supernatural Bible. The more I think about it, the more there is to it dealing with spirits, ghosts, devils, humanoid creatures, paranormal things, especially after being at a MUFON convention. I'm telling you, I saw some paranormal activity. In other words, or I would say uh, completely not normal activity. <clears throat> Some of the videos I showed you. Anyway, uh, we're still dealing with Matthew chapter 24 and probably the biggest single event that can take place in Matthew chapter 24 is what we're dealing with. The, the darkening of the sun, the moon turning to blood, but then the falling or the casting out of heaven of at least, well, one third of the angels of heaven. I say at least because there is an innumerable company of angels. That's what Paul says, which means there's a lot of them. So many we can't count them, just like the stars. But God knows how to count them. God knows how to cut off a third of them. And what? He's going to cast these great big balls of fire that are even bigger than our sun to the earth? No. He's casting angels to this earth, evil, fallen, bad angels of all kinds. <clears throat> now, it occurred to me, all the research that I've done into witchcraft, the new age, new age, new age because it rhymes with sewage, secret societies, secret cults, Catholic church, you name it, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, transhumanism, um, all of that. I believe all of those things, the one great big gigantic secret that they believe that they're keeping, that they're not telling anybody what it is, I believe that this event is what they're referring to. So let's prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Let's prove all things with scripture. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Boy, I can't wait for that. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a trumpet. There's even a tarot card with that, of that. There is. Okay? No, I'm not saying tarot cards are the keys to the future. But whatever spirit was behind designing the tarot cards, I believe that spirit knew just a little bit about what they were talking about. This is the sure word of prophecy. Anyway, with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. As a matter of fact, Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll show you just how relevant that tarot card is. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Sleep is death. They shall sleep the sleep of death. But we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Take a look at that tarot card. 
the sounding of a trumpet, dead people rising up out of their graves. Hmm. I guarantee you the meaning behind that tarot card has nothing to do with the Christian resurrection, what we call the rapture, the translation, being caught up, it has nothing to do with it. It does, however, have something to do with the transformation of humankind. Not us, the other humans. Uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. <clears throat> the lady that I, I, I wanted to say, the lady that I argued with at the MUFON Symposium, I actually didn't really get a chance to argue with her because she kept going, I'm still talking. Dead wrong in what she said. She believes that instead of resurrection, there's reincarnation. But that denies what this says. It says that this corrupt body is what? Going to die and go into another corrupt body? You see, the whole idea, let me deal with this for a second. The whole idea of reincarnation, incarne, carne means meat, flesh. The whole idea of reincarnation is that if you live a bad life, when you die and go into your next body, your next body is going to pay for the sins of the deeds of the last body. And then hopefully you'll learn from that and then the next body you get, you'll live a better life. Here's the problem. <clears throat> Doesn't matter how many bodies you get. Every one of them wants to sin. Wants to sin horribly. And live a horrible, sinful, nasty, dirty, filthy life. Every single body that you might inherit in reincarnation is imposed to sin. It's going to sin. So there is not a chance in the world that by living another life, you're going to get better. Never happened. People have, people have lived in sin for thousands of years. Seeing the mistakes of people who've, you know, like their grandmas and grandpas who've made mistakes in the past and they say, son, don't do that. Grandson, don't do that. And yet we do it anyway. Never works. This mortality shall put on immortality, the Bible says. All right. So that goes along with back to Matthew chapter 24, when in verse 31, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now notice back in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul calls this, Behold, I show you a mystery. And it occurred to me when I was putting notes together for this, you know that I keep referencing this one book because it's a pretty good sized book and Manly Hall uh, did the research for everybody else in the world. Okay. There's to me, there's only one book. If you want to learn about the occult, there's, only, there's one book to read and that is the secret teachings of all ages because he digested a, an entire volume library. There's still a Manly P Hall library. I think it's out in California that go figure that. Um, and <clears throat> some rich person gave Manly Hall millions of dollars to go around the world and search for, kind of sounds like Robert Bigelow, kind of, and search for uh, the secrets, the, the two big secrets. Are we alone in this universe? And is, does our consciousness survive after death? And so Manly Hall went around gathering all these books, reading all these records, and compiling them all together into a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And what he says is, 
There's one great big gigantic, and I've been using the word secret, but it just popped out to me putting these notes together that, of course, Manley Hall uses the word secret, but he uses the word mystery or the mysteries as if it were a person. Notice this. The question may legitimately be propounded if these ancient mystical institutions were of such great pith and moment, why is so little information now available concerning them and the arcana, the arcana means secret or mystery, they claim to possess? The answer is simple enough. The mysteries, see how he capitalized the M? were secret societies, binding their initiates to inviolable secrecy and avenging with death the betrayal of their sacred trust. So that's like when Masons go like that. Okay, that means that if you ever tell the secret of what you found out in the Masonic Lodge, we will slit your throat from ear to ear we will cut open your bowels, pour out your bowels, burn them with fire, and scatter the ashes to the four winds. And we're supposed to go, <gasps> yeah. Um, although these schools were the true inspiration of the various doctrines promulgated by the ancient philosophers, the fountainhead of those doctrines was never revealed to the profane. In other words, the little guy down at the bottom of the Masonic ladder. Furthermore, in the lapse of time, the teachings became so inextricably linked with the names of their disseminators that the actual but recondite source, the mysteries, notice he capitalized it again, the mysteries, came to be wholly ignored. And I got to thinking about that. The Mysteries with a capital M. Hmm. I wonder who he could be taught. I got it. It's a name. Now, who is it that has the name Mystery? capital letters. Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. She is it. She is the one. Her spirit, and I want you to think of opposites here. Jesus tells us, what I speak into your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Tell everybody. There are no secret doctrines. We don't have secret ceremonies. We don't have secret rites. We don't have secret doctrines written in another book that we hide from the low members or the visitors that come in. We don't do secret rituals. We have windows in case you want to peep in during our church service. We, we stream it live for crying out loud. Okay. One thing I noticed Drive by a Jehovah's Witness Hall, Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witness. Look for windows. They don't seem to have very many windows in their building. What does that tell you? Anyway, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. It's called persecution, people. Get used to it. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So the two spirits, we have the Holy Spirit, which is of Christ, which tells us, tell everything that you learn, that you know, that I show you from scriptures, tell everybody. Then you have the opposite spirit of that, Mystery Babylon, which says, Don't say a word. Whisper it. 
so that only the person standing next to you can hear what you're, what you're saying. And outside of this room, nothing is to be told. There's a, a room for politicians and for people in the military called a SCIF. It's, that's a S-C-I-F something. It stands for something. I forgot what it stands for. But it's a security room. Before you go in, you take off your, your cell phone, your iWatch, uh, your scan for any kind of listening device. You enter into the room. There's no computers in there. There's no recording devices in there. The, 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 somebody hits a switch and the windows fog up. And it's where conversations can be held in secret so that only the people in that room can hear and know what's going on. I mean, as I'm speaking to you right now, this tablet is a listening device. That's what it is. If I've got a signal on, onto this tablet right now, it's a cellular tablet. If I have a signal right now, everything I'm, I'm saying is going out into a database somewhere. This is the world we live in right now. If not that, then my watch or my phone or maybe that implant I had put in my brain. No, I didn't have no implant put in my brain. But you get what I'm saying. She's the one who keeps everything secret. Why is it that the UFOs who are so intent on doing things with people on planet Earth have it just landed and said, I do. They're hard to catch on camera. Nearly impossible, I, I would say, to catch on camera. Now there's so many cameras around, people are. But as far as actual aliens being caught on camera or film, as far as the aliens landing on the front lawn of the White House, mm -mm. they're keeping, and they're telling lies too. I, I can't get into all that today. But the things that they're telling the humans that they interact with are nothing but pure lies. But these people believe it. These are devils. These are familiar spirits. These are evil angels. These are the ones that are going to get kicked out or have been kicked out of heaven already. And they're down here lying to people, getting them to believe this fantasy that they're going to bring, they're going to be the saviors of the planet. That's what they basically told the kids at um, the um, aerial school in Zimbabwe back in the 90s when that UFO landed and these three aliens came floating out of it and they were implanting images into these poor kids, you know, 9, 10, 11 year old kids that the earth is going to burn up and we're destroying the planet with our technology and, and doom and gloom and everything. And these kids are freaked out to this day. Okay. I mean, why do you do that? Why not? If you are who you really want people to think you are, if you're the saviors of the planet, well, the savior of this planet came down here and told everybody what he was doing. And if you didn't understand any of it, he said, I'm doing it according to the book that my father has written. Lo, it is, you know, in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will, O God. So everything that we need to know is right here in the pages of this Bible. That spirit is the one keeping the mysteries secret. And I have shown this before, but I'm going to tie the two together. That the idea is that the mysteries, the great arcana or the grand arcanum, which means great mystery, great secret, that the great secret of every secret society, every mystery religion like Catholicism, every single one of them is this event where God casts out a third of the angels of heaven. They come from heaven to the earth. And then somehow, some way, they mingle themselves with the seed of men. Let me show you a verse. Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Uh, let's see here. Acts 13. Matthew 13. Revelation 13. 
They marched around Jericho 13 times, one time a day for six days, seven times, seventh day. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, 13 words. Okay. So Deuteronomy 13 has a lot to do with this secret or this mystery. And notice what it says. If thy brother, who is a mason, let's just say your brother is a mason, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly. Secret handshakes, secret code words. Hey, won't you come join the lodge? Son, you need to join the lodge. You'll get jobs that way. They'll keep you working, feed your family. Oh yeah, I've had people tell me that. Son, you need to join the lodge. They keep your family working. Keep food on your table. If you, need, if you need to borrow money, you just go in the bank, flash a sign to the bank manager, you're in. Yep. Let us go and serve other, not another God, other gods. That's that one third of the angels, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely, of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee. Now notice this. From, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shalt thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou, what? Conceal him. Conceal is a secret mystery word covered up don't cover it up don't hide it what's the first thing adam and eve did after they ate the fruit covered up what is it that we have done in years past with our sins covered them up what's the one thing god tells us not to do cover them up we do things secretly god sees everything in the open and he will expose us in the open if we don't confess those sins. It's plain and simple. God says, don't conceal the guy. Don't conceal the guy who wants to draw you to serve other gods. I'm telling you, that's, that's at the core of the Catholic Church. The other gods are St. Jude, St. Thomas, St. Ignatius de Loyola, St. John the 23rd, St. John Paul the 2nd, St. Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. This, St. That. Those are other gods. In Freemasonry, they are the gods of old. They are the heavens, the stars that will come down to the earth in the UFO movement. They're the aliens. No matter what branch of anything except Christianity you get into to the Hind to the Hindu they're the 330 million think about that number 33 330 million 33 percent is one-third the 330 million gods of Hindu are the third of the angels that God's gonna kick out of heaven um, so if God says, if they entice thee secretly, saying, let us go after these other gods, God said, don't cover them up. Don't conceal them. They should be stoned to death. Now, that was the law that God had for the people of Israel. And he meant for them to keep it back now. Today, it's different. But back then, God intended for them to keep that law. If anybody said, hey, let's go serve these other gods, God said, don't conceal them. He's to be dealt with. Okay? Now, he mentioned from the end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Where does the earth end? Well, you could say at the beach, yes. But there is another end of the earth it is where earth ends and heaven begins there's a 
There's an actual line, like a barrier, like a boundary, like a territorial marker, a landmark, okay? Like nations have borders, states have borders, people's yards have fences. Well, the earth has a border around it, and it's called the Carmen line. Take a guess how many feet above, if you, it's not 33 feet. Take a guess at how many feet it is above the earth. It is 330,000 feet. Not making that up. The Kármán line, this is certainly a physical boundary where aerodynamics stops and astronautics begins. This is from Theodore von Kármán. And so I thought, why should it not also be a jurisdictional boundary? Haley has kindly called it the Kármán jurisdictional line. Below this line, space belongs to each country. Above this level, there would be free space. So when nations talk about, you're violating our airspace, China and Russia, Russian MiG jets cannot cross into United States airspace. If they do, they will either be chased off or it will be considered an act of war. But where does that end? It has to end somewhere. The nation's boundaries cannot extend all the way up to another galaxy. They end at a physical boundary called the Kármán line. So there is everything above the Kármán line belong. Did you see the movie uh, First Man? It's, it's about Neil Armstrong. It's okay movie. Um, but anyway, it starts out with him. I'm not kidding you. Historical event. He's flying a, 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 a rocketized airplane. Test. It's a test vehicle. Its number is 66672. Dun, dun, dun. I'm not kidding you. But anyway, and this is a true story. He's testing this plane. He gets up to the upper edge of the atmosphere. And, you know, planes work on air. And the wings and the aerolons and the whatever the things they call on the wings and the tail and everything. When they turn, the plane turns this way or that way or it nose dives or it goes up. Well, he got above where there was any air. There's no air. He got above that. So now he's technically an astronaut because he went above the Kármán line. The problem is he tries to go back down and he bounces off the atmosphere because it is a physical boundary and air pushes, especially at that speed, and he bounced off of it. And now he's got no way of getting down into the earth. And he's at risk of just going out in space and dying. So, and Neil Armstrong, you have to give him his credit. The guy was, he was pretty good at what he did. He, there are jets on the wings of this thing. That's the experimental part. And so he uses those jets to turn his plane into a knife. And his plane cut into the atmosphere. Instead of bouncing these big wings off of it, he turned his plane into a knife and cut back into the atmosphere and saved his life. Okay, that's first scene of the movie First Man. So there is a boundary. There is the end of the earth, and where the end of the earth is, heaven begins, or the heavens begin. Now I want you to understand that, because that's what I believe God is showing us. There are gods and a nation from the end of the earth or from the end of heaven, where heaven ends, earth begins, they're not from here. That's the nation that I've been trying to warn about. I'm sure others have as well, may, may not have done it the same way I've done it. But we're warning the world. We're trying to warn everybody. 
these gods and this nation that's coming are coming from up there and they're, they're no good. They're not any good. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of the Carmen line. Now, look at Daniel chapter 4. Here's an illustration of it. The tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. So the Bible's telling you that when it says the end of all the earth, it's telling you that's where heaven is. In other words, how tall does a tree have to grow before it reaches heaven? Well, we figured it out. We figured out 330,000 feet above sea level is the end of the earth. And that's, so if the Russians have a satellite and as long as they're above the Kármán line, they can fly over the United States all they want to. And um, they do every day. They've got satellites above this country. The Russians do, the Chinese do. You know they've got it satellites up there and that's perfectly legal because we don't have rights to the airspace above the Kármán line above the end of the earth we have no rights to that we have no rights to the moon we have no rights to mars nothing even though we put a flag up there we don't own it okay it's above the united states all right uh job 28 24 for he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven. You see, again, he puts it together. Under the whole heaven is where the ends of the earth are. Back in Daniel 4.11, the tree reached unto heaven and the sight to the end of all the earth. So where the earth ends, heaven begins. Job 37.3, he directeth it under the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. The whole heaven encompasses everything above the Kármán line, 330,000 feet. The ends of the earth encompass everything from the core of the earth, I guess, all the way up to the Kármán line, 330,000 feet above the earth, above sea level. And that's where the two are. Heaven is not earth. Earth is not heaven. But you'll see then in a lot of the Masonic literature, a lot of the teachings of Freemasonry from Fat Albert Pike and from Manley Hall and from others, they keep talking about what their symbols mean, like the square and the compass. And we'll get into that. But one of the symbols means heaven, and another of the symbols means earth. And how are they arranged? And what does that point to? Let's go to my, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, Psalm 19, to further illustrate this. This week, I'm laying the foundation for you. And I'm going to give you time. I'm going on vacation. I'm going to give you time to ponder it. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. The world, the earth, same thing. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So again, we see the end of the heaven is where the end of the world is and vice versa. Now, Deuteron back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Again with the 13. That seems to be the number for Mystery Babylon. In, Deuteron in 
Revelation 13, you have the beast. You have the false prophet. False prophet who is not going to tell everybody the truth. He's going to lie to people. Okay? Deuteronomy 13, 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known. Again, not another god. Not like, let's worship Krishna. Let's worship Buddha. Let's worship Baal. Let's worship Satan. No. Not another god. Other gods. The one-third of the angels that God is going to kick out of heaven. Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Now, he warns us about a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, gives a sign or a wonder. The Catholic Church is all about signs, wonders, and miracles. The miracle of Fatima. How is it that a person gets to become a saint in the teachings of the Catholic Church? They have to have I think one or at least one or two miracles attributed to them. So if they perform a sign or a wonder, then they are elevated by the Catholic Church to the position of a saint, which means that the faithful Catholics all over the world can then pray to those gods. Remember what the first commandment is. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Meaning that you cannot pray to Saint Joseph. You cannot pray to Saint jo Joseph and ask Saint Joseph to pray to Jesus or God for you. You're putting another God before God. You're putting another God between you and God. And God says, no, you cannot do that. You shall have no other gods before me. And in this case, he says, other gods which thou hast not known. The sign or the wonder will come to pass. The false prophet is going to guarantee that signs and wonders come to pass. He's going to be full of lying signs and wonders, the Bible says. And they're going, to, they're going to take place. Signs and wonders, miracles up in the heavens and so on. Maybe magic tricks, I don't know. But he's going to be able to do those. And then he's going to say, here are the gods. Let us go and serve them. Now God says... I sent that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. I sent him to you to prove you, to test you. Remember, Peter talks twice about the trial of our faith. Do we really believe and hold to the words of the scriptures and never walk away from them? Or will we follow after the signs and wonders? And I promise you, there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians in this internet age, who are full of internet Christianity, which for the most part is no good, but they're full of internet Christianity, that I promise you when the signs of the wonders come take place, they're going to follow after that. They're going to receive these fallen angels as their gods. And God says, I'm going to, I'm going to use that to prove you to see whether you will follow after me and my statutes and my commandments or not. 
because if you stick with my word, you'll know that those things are liars, they're not gods, they're not me, and you shouldn't follow after them. But if you don't hold on to this book, read it, know it, meditate on it, think on these things the Bible says, then God says, I'm going to turn you over and you're going to believe the guy that shows you a sign of the wonder and it comes to pass and he's going to say, boom, let's go worship these angels. Okay? Deuteronomy 28. Listen to this. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. What other people? Think about it. A people, a nation, a nation of people is how God describes the northern army. A people doesn't have to be an on earth human people. The God's people. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. In Deuteronomy 28, that wonderful chapter. If you've not read Deuteronomy 28, I strongly encourage you. It is, a, it is full of, well, I'll tell you. Deuteronomy 28 is one of the places that really God used to bring me back to the King James. And I don't want to get too much into that today. But I knew that God had made a covenant with Israel as a nation, as a, 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 a political, civil contract, covenant, as a people. And any group of people, they need a government. Men need government. The Mayflower Compact, let me just go, go this way for a minute. The Mayflower Compact. When the pilgrims were on the ship, the Mayflower, they were under the captain's governing authority. Whatever the captain said, that's what they had to do. If the captain said, get below deck, they had to get below deck. If the captain said, you need to help out, clean up, they had to help out, clean up. But the pilgrims knew that they couldn't just go to the land and be free man on the land, sovereign citizens. They knew they couldn't. So they wrote up the Mayflower Compact, which formed a very primitive government so that when they left the Mayflower and stepped on land, now the captain, if the captain says, get back on board ship, ye mateys, they say, we're not under your authority any longer, Captain. We are on land. We have formed a government. And any such laws and bills that we pass after this will be our governing authority. Not ye, Captain, matey. Okay? God had given Israel a civil government to judge them. And it was his written law. And the only administrators or public officials or governors in that, in that form of government were the judges. Moses was one, and then Moses named others to be judges to help him out in judging the affairs. But the bottom line was, this book was their law. And if they followed the, and if they didn't follow the law, then they were brought to one of the judges and the judge would hear the evidence. And if they broke the law, then they were given lashes or they had to pay back. Or in some cases, they had to be killed. It's as simple as that. And, and I knew that it seemed to me that our founding fathers recognized, even Benjamin Franklin, who at best was a deist, recognized that God was building a nation. 
And I'm looking at Deuteronomy 28 and I'm going, you know what? That seems to be the history of America. When America was at least, I'm not saying that at, at one time America was all saved. I'm not saying that. But at one time there was a regard for God in this country. Children prayed to God in school. Children learned about God in school. That's how my grandparents grew up. So at one time, this nation was established on these principles. And God used that. I'm not going to get into the rest of it. But God used that to help me understand this book is right. 100% right. Guaranteed. Okay? So Deuteronomy 28, God starts out with, it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments. Then I'll blessed shalt thou be in thy city and in the field and the fruit of thy body and of thy cattle, thy sheep, thy basket and the store. When thou comest in and thou goest out. God's got all these blessings. But then, but if it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to serve, observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Commandments, statutes, laws, they're all the same thing to anybody who's a sovereign citizen out there. They're the same thing. So anyway, this is part of it. God says if you get to a point to where you will not keep my statutes, my judgments, my laws, as a nation... This is what I'm going to do to you. Okay? So he says, a nation which thou knowest will eat up all of your resources. Then he said in verse 36, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. Now stop right here. What nation is it that we don't know? What nation is it? We know every nation that there is in the world. We know every kingdom. We know every form of government. We know every land, everything. We, we know it. So the nation that he's talking about here, they're not from here. And then notice what he says, Deuteronomy 28, 42. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. Hmm. Shall the locust consume. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Mmm. That kind of locusts. Deuteronomy 28, 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Stop right here. That would be, probably don't have time to turn to it, Daniel chapter 2 and the Iron Kingdom. A yoke of iron. The word yoga means yoke. And what you're doing when you play around and practice and meditate, do the meditation of yoga, you are emptying your mind, you're putting your mind into an altered state similar to drunkenness and you are making contact with 330 million billion kajillion gods 
that are out there. I mean, how does Stephen Greer get in contact with all these alien UFOs that show up every time he has a CE5 event? They go into a yoga trance and open up their heart chakra so that the beings out there know that we mean them no harm. What, we mean them no harm, really? Like we can harm them? He doesn't use a radio, doesn't use a telegraph, doesn't use a cell phone, nothing like that. They're using a form of contact that was meant for devils, spirits. The iron yoke upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from, here it is, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Stop right here. I told you, I met Colonel Halt. I got to see John Burroughs from the RAF um, Woodbridge UFO event. Uh, Sergeant Penniston was not with them. He has done some interviews, but he doesn't like it. He doesn't like people calling him a kook. And I don't blame him. But him and Burroughs were there when the UFO landed. Or let's say, let's say the chariot. Because they both knew and had the feeling that this wasn't just a machine sitting there in front of them. It was a living organism. And as Penniston run his hand across the smooth glass, he saw writing on it that he had never seen before. He said it looked like glyphs of some kind, and he tried to draw out very quickly what it was he was seeing while he was there. But as soon as he touched the glyphs, the letters, Instantly, he got what he called a brain download. And he knew nothing. This is 1980. Okay? Who knew of binary code back in 19... Well, Bill Gates did. What code he stole. Anyway, he didn't know anything about binary code. He had never messed with computers before. It's 1980. Okay? But he got all these zeros and ones in his brain. And they stayed there until finally he started writing them down and as he's writing them down he's feeling better and when he gets to the last zero and one boom it's gone and to this day he's got the notes and it's been translated I don't understand it all but everybody that I've ever read or heard of in the UFO movement who's had contact with these they see strange writing they hear them speaking a language that they can't understand. And I'm asking the question, if this is some earthly army, what language is it that we can't understand? It doesn't exist. Everybody knows every language. Somebody on this earth knows another language, or everybody knows every language. I'll put it like that. Okay, you figure that out. But anyway, whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. Hmm. Yeah. Which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. Linda Moulton Howe. Do you know how she got started in the UFO business? They sent her out to do a story on cattle mutilations. Back in the 70s. And I remember hearing when I was a kid growing up in the 70s about how it was satanic cults that were mutilating these animals. And I remember us kids walking down the road one time, this old road that everybody used as a dump place. I don't know why they always dumped their stuff there, but everybody did. And there was a dead animal in the road. And we were like, oh my goodness, this is one of them. There's a witch coming around here somewhere. It was just a roadkill, Mike. But that's how she got started. She got started in 
the UFO business by looking at cattle mutilations. And it became very, very clear to her that these cattle, having had every single cell of blood drained completely out of them, incisions made that looked like a laser had done it. And in every one of them, the same thing. If it was a, if it was a female, the udders were, were in, incised and taken out. Male or female, the genitals were taken out. A chunk of the side of the mouth was taken out. And every one of them placed back there on the ground, no blood anywhere, no animal footprints, human footprints, the ground around it wasn't disturbed, nothing. Nothing. That blood, what is in blood? Life. Life. He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil. Stop right here. You know what a Masonic um, cornerstone ceremony involves? They take the cornerstone. It's on a tripod, three and they take corn, wine, and oil and pour over that stone as an offering to the stone. Shall not leave thee corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he hath destroyed thee. Mm. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at all the places in the Bible. This is your homework. And I'll be gone a couple weeks on vacation, so you'll have plenty of time. Look up all the places in the Bible, the ends of the world, end of heaven, the end of earth, end of the world, end of the worlds, ends of the world. Look at all those places. Look, look for that nation that's going to come from the end of heaven or from the end of the earth where heaven starts. Look for that nation in the Bible. And then I'll start showing you the quotes from Freemason authorities like Albert Pike and so on and I'll show you that every Masonic Rosicrucian you name it symbol every single one of them points to the day the one significant historic day of all days where God is going to thrust out a third of the angels from heaven and they're coming to this earth. And then what's going to happen on that day? You can even look at some things related to Freemasonry. And see the, read some of the quotations about, you can find a copy of Morals and Dogma on, on the internet. Free. It's free download. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. It's been out of copyright for years so it's probably free but look at all the places that reference the heavens the earth and them being joined together because that's where we're going with this all right the lord bless you i love you i thank you for all the help that you give to us i thank you for your prayers for me for our family for our church Keep us in those prayers. Remember the people of Kenya, the people that we love so dearly. We enjoy helping them. We thank you for helping us help them. Pray for them. 
pray that God will bless those ministries. The devil's tried to stop those ministries over and over and over again. Dozens of times he's tried to withstand us. And God just keeps us going. To God be the glory. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.